Hello and welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar, and with me today, this week, is Beatrice Landsbergen, or otherwise known as Bea. Hi, Bea. Hi. <laughs> I think I overintroduced you there, but it's fine. I think it's all for the fun. Everybody knows who Bea is. She's done a few interviews with us already, but this week, it was a very, very interesting episode. We interviewed Benjamina Bullock from the company Higher Stakes. Can you maybe give a brief introduction to who she is, Bea? Sure, yes. So today we're going to be talking to Benjamina. And actually, as Srinath mentioned, the company, it's UK-based and they're called Higher Stakes. But interestingly, Higher Stakes is spelled in a really funky way. So you'll see that on the title of the podcast. Um, And so today we're going to be talking to Benjamina specifically more about lab-grown meat, how it's made, and what are the biggest challenges that they're trying to solve. And we're also going to dive into more specific questions, such as how can we create different textures in cell cultured meat and the use of genetic engineering. And for example, also how cultured meat will be able to com- compete with convention- the conventional market. Um, so we were also actually really interested in hearing Benjamina's story on how she founded this company and what inspired her. So we'll also dive into, uh, into that. All right. That sounds quite interesting stick around with us we're gonna jump straight into the interview and we'll see you on the other side of this hello everyone so welcome benjamina um we're really happy to have you here. Can you please introduce yourself? I'm Benjamina. I'm the founder and CEO of Higher Stakes. So we're a cultivated meat company. So what we do is we're addressing some of the biggest environmental and human health challenges um, by making meat using cell culture technology. So we take a small sample of cells from the animal, which we expand and then guide to become muscle, fat, and all the different types of tissue that you need to recreate meat and starting with pork as an initial product. So maybe if you could go back, rewind, and let's go from the basics. So you're a company that does lab-grown meat. So how exactly can you make lab-grown meat? How is it done? Yeah, so we don't like to call it lab-grown meat for a few reasons, because essentially while now it's in the lab, you know, companies are already starting to be in pilot, and later we want to move to manufacturing. So either people call it cultivated or cultured um, meat but essentially the way the way it works is that we need a sample of tissue from the animal and this can be a different different thing so in our case we're working with more skin patches or blood samples but people can take samples from the muscle um, from fat from different types um, of tissues Um, in our case we're working with a type of cell called induced pluripotent stem cells so Essentially, we're taking that cell and and bringing it back to the embryonic state. Um, We then expand those cells and then guide them to become muscle, fat, and all of the different types of tissues that you need to recreate your meat. And we're working as well in in um, with plant based materials in order to enhance um, those um, those tissues to make an even better product. So you keep on talking about trying to get a cell from somewhere, and especially these uh, pluripotent stem cells. Where did these cells come from? So they come from the animal, and then the different, depending on the cell line that you're creating, you'll take the sample from a different place in the animal in a way. So just to follow up a little bit on the iPSCs that you talk about, so these cells that you usually take from an adult tissue, and so generally meat is from the adult tissue. So is it just, if you're trying to look for a specific cut of meat, is it just from those tissues for this specific cut? Or is it from, are you able to, you know, transform from one cell type to another using the laboratory processes? So that's one of the advantage of working with the cells that we're working with is that they can become any type of tissue. Um, and so that's one of the reasons we've decided to go ahead with that one, whereas certain types of cells can only turn into other types of cells or stay the same cell as they are. Okay, so you take the cell, 
and the cell is then grown to make the meat. Am I, am I right? That's right. And so how do you, how does the cell turn into a piece of meat? What, what's the process that it undergoes? So you mean once you've grown the cell? Yeah. So the cell um, is grown and also guided to become the different types of tissue in something called the media. So that's the liquid that's feeding the cell. And all of that, you do it in something called the bioreactor, which is essentially the container in which the media and the cells are. And depending on what you feed the cells, they'll become different tissues. So if you feed them you know, one formulation, they'll grow. If you feed them another formulation, they'll turn into muscle. If you feed a third formulation, they'll turn into fat. And to help all of this, you can also grow them on something called a scaffold, which essentially helps them get the right structure as those cells um, get become muscle, um, particularly. And what is this type of formulation that you use? What do you mean by that? So, um, so you said that by giving the cell different type of formulation, you can get it to uh, grow in a different way. So what, what is this formulation? So obviously I can't go into details of that, um, but it's essentially a liquid with, you know, amino acids, salts, and, you know, all, all of the different components that the cells need in order to grow and to turn um, it turn into the different types of tissue. So different companies will use different formulation. Um, and that's part essentially of the intellectual property of the different companies as what do you actually feed them? And there's different methods of doing that. Is it synthetically made or do you take it from a natural source? I won't be able to answer that, but we don't use feed double vine serum. If, if that's the question. <laughs> Yeah, that that's what would mainly interest me because, of course, as a um, cultured meat, uh, an advantage of it is the fact that um, you don't need to kill animals for it. But then if you're taking the medium from the animal, then that was a bit uh, counterintuitive to me. But that that makes a lot of sense. Then I'm also excited to see when your meat comes onto the market. Um, maybe then you'll also tell us a bit more about the way it's made. Yeah, it's it's hard, right? Because obviously a, a lot of it is is um is IP and so we want to make sure we yeah. <laughs> okay. So, moving along. So, when you use uh you, you you said you can use a matrix to grow it or you can also use like a like a sort of like the bioreactors. So, when you use these techniques, are you able to provide certain specific textures that people are looking for? Or are you able to create the uh, something which is mimicking real meat or something which is mimicking the plant-based meat? So is it, is it so how do how do you create the texture? Yeah, so there's different ways of creating the textures, and I would put them in really three big categories. Um, so one of them is using the scaffolding, which you know obviously helps, and there's different scaffolds i mean you can work with synthetic materials people work with decelerized you know spinach leaves there's a lot of different things that can be used um, as a scaffold you also have 3d printing that has gained quite a lot of popularity and you then have the more traditional methods as well of just food you know food science that you can use to shape your materials and shape your your cells and other ingredients into the product that you want and I think different companies are exploring different ones and sometimes a mixture of, of those as well. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of options and there's a lot of opportunities as well within that. So can you also use genetic engineering of the cells in order to make a particular meat? Absolutely. Or get the texture that is desired. So, well, again, there's different aspects and, um, where you can use genetic engineering, whether you want to use it on to create the scaffold, to um, to create the growth factors, whether you use it on the cell lines themselves. Um, you can use genetic engineering in different aspects. And again, depending on what you do, the regulatory approval process will be different. 
Yeah, how is the regulatory approval process? Because in the US, I could imagine it to be a lot easier to use genetically engineered cells, whereas in Europe, it might be a bit harder. It, it might be easier in the US, definitely. Um, but we, we don't, we haven't seen any products approved yet at all with cultivated meat. And, you know, it, it's an extra barrier. Um, using genetic engineer, genetical engineering, regardless of the, the location, will be an extra barrier in terms of regulatory approval. Okay. So this, this takes me into the, like, a, a little, a, in a slightly different direction. Because the aim for the lab grown or to take synthetically sort of made meat is is to relieve the dependency on the large meat market that we currently have where animals are grown for slaughter. So what is the other than that, what else do you think is the biggest significant challenge that you're trying to target with this type of uh, with this with your company? other than the animal uh, cruelty aspect. So are there other aspects which you're trying to target with the lab grown? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, one of the big ones is antibiotic resistance, which is an enormous problem. If we continue the way we're going, we'll be killing more people than cancer. And it's one that we have very little control of at the moment. Um, Foodborne diseases, all of the environmental. So this is, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, but also water usage, land usage. Um, And I think one of the things as well is that because we're creating new processes, we have a lot more opportunities to do things right from the beginning, right? It's a lot harder to change systems that are there and exist already today and that are set in the ways rather than when you start a process from scratch, it's a lot easier to try and use more you know renewable energies to try and create your process in a way where it is more environmentally friendly and really optimize for that because from day one this is something that we're conscious of so uh, another thing that i wanted to ask you is is that is that you you clearly have to employ different people with different sets of expertise in all of these different fields because it's clearly a task which requires humongous effort in each so like a person definitely who who knows the biology of it the chemistry of it as well as someone who knows you know if you're using 3d printing someone who knows engineering aspects of things and so how do you uh how do you sort of uh, you know manage so many people because you're you're a fairly new company at the moment yeah so i think it's setting first what are the priorities what are the things that we need immediately so there are things for example when you just start a company you don't yet need um and so looking at which roles are the priority and you know, I think also managing your own expectations, so not expecting one person to be able to do absolutely everything, but hiring people that have some of that urgent expertise, but also can learn about some of those new aspects and, you know, get, we're all learning and everything, even if there's a lot of skills that are new and that no one in the world has really, um, that we all need to develop. So I think getting people that learn fast is really, really, really crucial for the industry. So then let's talk a bit about higher stakes since we've gotten into, we've gotten an introduction on the way lab grown meat works. So now tell us a bit about what higher stake does and what sets you apart from other companies that do similar things. Because I was looking at your website and it said that you focused on pork. So why did you choose to focus on pork? Um, for example, that'd be the first, uh, First good question. Yeah, so higher stakes focus more, even more precisely on bacon and pork belly as our first meats. We decided to go with pork because it's the most widely consumed meat in the world. And at the same time, there's a shortage at the moment with African swine fever. There's a huge amount of antibiotics used on, on pigs. Um, and this is, you know, all around the world. And... And on top of that, there's a lot of processed products. Um, so that makes it easier to replicate some of the products and 
it's genetically similar to human, which sounds really gross, but because most of the research is still done on the human um, therapeutic side, um, it makes it easier to adapt protocols, but also vice versa, the technologies that we're creating um, are more likely to have value in, in that sector as well. And so how does making um, pork meat in the lab differ from making, for example, beef? Is it harder or is it easier based on texture and taste? Yeah, so I mean, beef is quite difficult because a lot of the kind of big cuts have a lot of marbling um, and have a quite strong as well taste and um, and feel like you can see the blood quite, you know, quite strongly and it plays a quite important part. And so, di but different meats have different advantages, right? Um, chicken will have some advantages over pork and beef. So different companies can start with a different meat at start at the starting point. And the closer the animal, the easier it is to adapt your your experiments and your methods to the new meat. So it will be easier to pass from pork to beef um, because they're both mammals than from pork to you know um, shellfish, for example. Okay, so I kind of want to go in. Uh, so since you're the founder and CEO of Higher Stakes, so that's that's the executive officer. So clearly the, the cost of things would de definitely, you know, it'll be weighing on your mind because currently certain types, so meat in general is like, for example, the, the commonly produced meat in the mass scale, it's not super expensive, it's quite cheap. So how do you plan to compete with that? Because when it comes to, convincing purchasing or or consumers to buy your meat which you know so how do you reach uh, the cost that you want to sell at or to compete with the current market yeah so we already have plans of how we'll get the the cost of our technology down and a lot of it as well on top of the inventions that you know we're working on on top of that there will be a lot of economies of scale so the industry at the moment is producing you know, very, very little. Um, and no one is yet in mass production. And so getting to that mass production scale will obviously continue to bring costs down. And I think on the long term, we can become even cheaper than meat. And there will be as well new inventions that we can't even think of yet um, that will come and, and push this further. But I think more and more the cost um the cost curve has been quite amazing you know if you think about the first burger that was 300,000 and now the cost at which companies are at um and and some have already disclosed it's it's pretty amazing to see so do you think that when lab grown sorry when the cultured meat gets onto the market, that it will be able to compare and compete with other plant-based alternatives? I think it will it will be able to compare with the more higher end of the market, um, but it won't yet be the cheapest meat when it goes to market. It will take a little bit more time. So what is going to be one of the first products that you're going to try to release? So the first products that we're working on are bacon and pork belly. So bacon is more aimed at the U.S. and European market and uh, pork belly more at the Asian market. Okay, so because you, you have different markets in mind, you clearly would have some competitors in these markets as well. So c do you have an idea of, of who your major competitors are and how, how do you plan to compete in these different markets? So I won't disclose how, you know, how we're planning to compete, but, you know, there's different aspects of competition and you have, I mean, food in the really broadest sense. People need to eat and you're competing with what they're eating, then a bit more narrow protein, then you have kind of alternative proteins and then really cultivated meat. And it depends how you're looking. But us as a company, we're really less trying to compete when it comes when it comes to the market we're less trying to compete with other cultivated meat company um but more really getting more people to go into the sector as a whole and to eat cultivated meat um as a whole 
where we do compete is more around things like IP and talent and, and so on. But when it comes to the market itself, um, it's an enormous market. So there's a lot of growth to, to go. Yeah, yeah, completely, completely agree with you that. So when I ask how do you plan to compete, I'm, I, I clearly I'm not looking for the, the economical or the way you plan to go to market or n none of the strategy behind it. But it, it, it was more of a question about how, so, you know, if a person, if, if, let's say if it's a person A who's generally satisfied with, the, you know, who's from, a, let's say, a, an upper middle class family who's able to spend more money on more premium products, so the, the trying to convince such a person to go for your product would be a more of a difficult task than trying to convince them someone who doesn't eat meat or doesn't buy or like doesn't eat cultured meat or doesn't buy cultured meat to go for such a product. So this was kind of the direction in which I was asking that question. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure I get what you mean. I think what I also understood from you, Srinath, is like, or at least this is also a question that I would have, is how do you try to get convince people to go for cultured meat when they're opposed to eating normal meat? I mean, we're not trying to convince vegans or vegetarians. That's not our target market. Our target market are people that actually do eat meat. Um, but the way we're, we're looking to convince them is to give them a product that's as good, that's similar cost and and that's just better for them right so being at comparison on the things that people care about which you know are cost taste and availability and being better on everything else i actually have two questions based on what you've just said so the first one would be why aren't you trying to convince vegans or vegetarians because to me this seems like a really good alternative for vegans and vegetarians which uh i mean depending on what research you read it, there's some that says that you know meat is actually healthy for you so that'd be the first question and then the second question would be you mentioned that um this kind of meat could be better for you so this cell cultured meat does it have could it have different nutrients and properties to uh meat directly from an animal um so to answer your fir the first part of your question the reason we're not targeting vegans and vegetarians i mean the first reason is really because we want to have an impact right and so the impact compared to what they currently ate um will be you know none or or very little um, whereas if we're trying to switch from meat, then that's where the impact really lies, right? When we're trying to work, I'm creating a business that is not just, and, and this is the same for everyone, right? The whole, the whole industry is creating a business that is not just for profit, but also for impact. So you want to maximize the impact. And so if you're targeting vegans and vegetarians, that's not where you maximize vegans. And as you mentioned as well, some people haven't eaten uh, meat in, in years, so they might be even harder um, harder to convince. Um, the second part of your question, could you remind me? Sorry. Yeah, that was about the nutrients. So could you get different nutrients? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so you could you could get different nutrients um, from cultivated meat than from conventional meat, and we have a lot more flexibility to address that. Now, you could create a fat-free bacon. Is it going to taste as good as real bacon? Probably not. So you want to balance, you know, the health and improvement aspect with as well something that tastes really good and that that is what people expect from the product and so you're talking about fat free or adding fat can you modify the amount of fat that you put in and can you use plant-based alternatives if you wanted to um, yeah I, I don't know if you can say something about that so yeah we could we could use different types of fat and we could use uh, you know plant-based fats I think um, plant-based fats have their you know their own issues in terms of taste particularly um and and really being what people expect from a meat product um and i think the industry is actually looking more the opposite whereas you know you're starting to get more and more companies that are doing the fat only 
but um, and mixing that with uh, with plant based products. So from our perspective, it's pretty important to have both the muscle and the fat um, coming from um, from culti- cultivated cells, um, at least part of it. So can you tell us if you've tried this cultured meat before? I have, yeah. So we did a prototype um, in back in July and, and tried as well different um, samples so, since. Can you tell us how it was? <laughs> yeah, so the prototypes were really good. I mean, look, it wasn't it wasn't perfect. Um, it, it wasn't exactly yet the same, and it's something that we're working on. But it was it, it they were really good. Interesting. So, when do you think that the general population will be able to try? Will be able to try a prototype? So I think it depends who you mean by general population and, you know, where in the world and do they buy it? I think, you know, there are more and more people that are from the general population that become part of tastings of companies here and there. Um, And again, you know, people that can go to one restaurant in the world, but it's a different question than it being in the supermarket the same way as even plant-based meats are today. Definitely. So this kind of leads me into uh, like a different direction because we've been talking about how you, you sort of manufacture these or like, of course, not the details, but how you manufacture these and about the company itself. And this kind of leads me to a story because you seem to be very motivated to try this thing. So definitely you have you should have an interesting story which which led you to found this company. So can you what can you tell us what inspired you to sort of start this company and what 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 made you look into uh, cultured meats? Yeah, so I was really looking at what would be the best way to have a maximum of impact on people's health and thinking about you know different aspects from mental health to you know more conventional kind of um, health and looking at really different different areas and got introduced to the concept of cultivated meat, which, you know, has been around for decades. And for me, it was just absolutely amazing the impact it could have from all those different aspects that we discussed throughout the podcast. And I think both seeing that with the combination of I've been, you know, really passionate about food for forever. <laughs> um, and so I think the combination of the impact with the food, things being food, which has been such an important part of my life, and with as well this, the skills and having, taking the different skills that I had, um, that I had learned throughout, throughout my career, but also the skills that I could develop in the future, I think all of that combination is what really, really drew me in to starting a company in in this in the sector. So, what's your background then? What what did you study, and do you have a PhD or a master's, bachelor? Yeah, so I have a master's in chemical engineering. Um, so did that at Imperial in in London. Um, so you know, I'm I not as qualified on the cells as everyone else on the team, but I think it also brings a different perspective, right? So having done that engineering degree really enabled me to see things in a different way than a lot of the people that were previously um, in the field that had done the more traditional route of kind of stem cell biology. So did you find that it was difficult for you only having, so not having like say a PhD in cells or in that kind of direction do you find it hard at the beginning to understand everything or is it fine i mean it was a learning curve without doubt i think you know i think it was sometimes it felt frustrating that i couldn't always do everything myself but i think overall it was really a benefit um and it allowed me to take things from a different perspective but you know at the start, it was definitely a learning curve and it definitely, you know, I had to 
to to keep up to date and and learn a lot of new concept and new new methods that's part of the excitement right is um learning as well a lot and so how did you find the right people to work with cuz i'm assuming that you build a team of also scientists so how did you go about searching for them and finding the right ones so you know there's many different ways to to look for people and you first you, you know you can create the network so working on creating the right network and getting those people to introduce you to people but looking as well at you know linkedin is a great resource you can look as well at uh, research papers and looking at ac- academic groups that are, that are researching in the field or parallel fields so we've done different methods and really um the people that we have now on the team have come from various um yeah various ways so this kind of leads me into asking you about so like because i i when you said you're a chemical engineer because i i studied chemical engineering i did my bachelor's in chemical engineering as well although my bo- master's was in biology so i kind of uh, so when i when i try to understand the reactors and uh, all these different tools that we we learned in engineering and also when we used to work with micro microbiology as during my uh, during my master's studies so we were using bioreactors to create certain type of type of biofilms to study them so it it's kind of really fascinating from a scientific point of view to see how you can manufacture uh, or sort of create a culture the meat itself which is like a like a physical object so could you sort of put into simple terms for people about why they should so for example try and try, so when when you come to market that is so do you could you put in simple terms what 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 should motivate people to go for your meat absolutely well you know i think there's a couple of reasons so one it will be healthier for people so there's significantly less chances of foodborne diseases we're doing things in a much cleaner way so that's for me is you know the number one the number two is really the impact so thinking beyond yourself and that's coming to things you know like the env- um greenhouse gas emissions water usage and think about the impact that we're having globally and people are more and more realizing um obviously you know not hurting animals there's all of these aspects but without letting go of the things that are important to us which are you know the taste and the price um so not something that will break the bank and the availability as well for things to be convenient um it's you know n- nice and well if it's in one restaurant but what you really want is for it to be widespread and wherever i go for you know me as a consumer to have it really there um when i like to purchase it benjamin tell us again how we should uh yeah what well, what terminology is the correct one just so that i get this straight <laughs> i mean we're still figuring out which one exactly and there's different debates um but as an industry we're we're trying to get people away from lab grown because it creates an image which we don't believe is the right image because a lot of the processed products you know start in a lab at some point and really what we will create is factories of um of meat so let's say you know cultivated cultured all of those work um cell based meat even all of those are are fairly neutral and we found there are the mm, there are the names that are some uh, offensive to some people so slaughter free meat and clean meat have been offensive to the meat industry and some are offensive kind of fake meat or lab grown meat are nearly offensive to you know salvage or cultured meat companies so i think it's finding terms that are more neutral um that aren't as offensive for either parties essentially and that are descriptive and enticing enough for consumers as well yeah i mean that 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 makes a lot of sense so do you ever find that it's hard to convince people uh of trying out uh this cultured meat do you feel like most people are open to it or a lot of people still need convincing 
we're, we're not in a position where I can answer that question yet because, you know, for, for now we're more having to tell people, no, we, you can't taste it um, rather than the opposite. But, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's still... Uh, it's still very early on, right? Like it, it's not like we're in supermarkets and struggling to get people to try it. It's it's too early for me to answer that question. But but in general, do you feel like people uh, are positive towards this kind of meat, or they're a bit skeptical about it? I think overall, people are positive. There are definitely some skeptical, and there are people that you know are positive but with a little bit of skepticism but again it depends who you're targeting taking as well the context of the fact you know the fact that it hasn't been even approved anywhere in Europe for example right um so if you take things at how early the whole industry still is then i think it's been extremely positive so would it be safe to call higher stakes a startup Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so definitely. So with startup, you would have definitely you'd be looking for investors, right? So how are you able to convince the investors? So in in what sense, able to convince them? No, I mean about the potential of the market for sure. I mean, I think a lot of investors do see the potential in you know in in this field in alternative proteins in general, and we've seen a lot of investment coming into the field because. It's clearly a need. It's clearly a problem. Um, and, you know, you can see that there are consumers that are there. Some people are more skeptical about the consumer acceptance. Some investors are more skeptical around the technology. Some are more around the regulatory. Some find it difficult to compare companies. So, you know, different investors will have different risks and um, that you'll have to address. But overall, you know, I think, people understand that it's a big, big, big problem and that is going to happen. And I think it's more going into the details and different types of investors and different individual investors will have different concerns that, you know, as a company, we when we pitch, we aim to address. Mm -hmm. So usually when people start talking of investors, what comes to my mind is Shark Tank or Dragon's Den or something of that sort. So uh, have you sort of uh, uh, tried to, you know, uh, approach something of this sort just to try to get the word out about the company and the product? Um, we haven't been on, on Shark Tank or anything like that. We haven't done crowdfunding either. I think also a lot of times it's a lot more helpful if you have a product that's on the market and so that not only you get the investment, but you also get the publicity so that people can immediately go and buy your product. And whereas, you know, it's a different thing when your product is, is still under development. So I think with that, we've come to the end of our uh, interview with Patrice. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. All right, so that was an interesting discussion with Benjamin. Yeah, it was actually super interesting. I definitely learned stuff that I didn't know before. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting to see that the cultured meat revolution is starting in front of our eyes. I mean, it's so important for the environment. And it's also important to see that there are so many companies taking steps in this direction which is basically bringing a lot of competition as well as a lot of uh, interesting ideas on how to get things done without actually harming animals as well as without uh, you know creating as much greenhouse gas emissions as we can. Yeah definitely I think this podcast is just also really important to kind of get people aware of what's going on the the research which is still at its infancy but um, it's nice to I hope that this podcast can really stimulate some discussion on it. Such an important topic, which uh, which we'll see and hear more about in the future. Yeah. What, what, what were your uh, primary takeaways from the interview with Benjamin? Um, so I think one of the biggest takeaways is just the impact that it's going to have in the future um, and how it's hopefully going to solve uh, a lot of issues. Um, yeah, I'd say that's probably the biggest one. There's obviously a lot of unanswered questions yeah, I, that I would have liked to know, but of course it's all protected IP, so 
we can't know everything right now. Yeah, I mean, that's completely true because, right, again, like you said, the research is in its infancy. There's a lot of there's a lot of companies which are doing stuff in similar directions. So there's also a lot of competition in the field. So I, I think it's, it's important that a company which is, you know, uh, starting out in the, in, the, in the field and in the industry has at least the necessary publicity that they need and the, and the tools they can acquire in the process in order to sort of, you know, make their claim on the big wide world of uh, what they call as meat eaters market. Right. So, I mean, I think it, it was quite interesting. And I guess from a scientific point of view, we could have definitely gotten more information or we would we would have liked to have gotten more information. But again, the IP loss and everything, especially within their uh, within their company. I, I, yeah, let's, let's yeah, no, it, def- it definitely makes anyway. sense. I think until uh, cultured meat companies start mass producing, it's just they have to keep their intellectual property protected. But who knows, in 10 years, hopefully, we'll get more information, we'll know more about the processes that they're going to be using, um, fats involved, etc., etc., all the questions that uh, Benjamin could not answer today. Yeah. Anyway, I think, I hope you all enjoyed today's episode. If if you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, just please really feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phcnet.mpg.de. We're looking forward to your feedback. We also are on Twitter at MPPHCNet Podcast, on Instagram at Offspring Magazine underscore the podcast, and on LinkedIn and Facebook. And yeah, you can find us everywhere. And also, if you're so interested just... in the work that Benjamin and Higher Stakes do, make sure to follow them on LinkedIn. I know Benjamina is active on LinkedIn, and they also, I think, have a Twitter page and a really good website where you can find more information on them. Yeah. All right. So with that, we'd like to say thank you for listening and have a nice day. Have a nice week and see you all next week. Until then, it's a bye. Yeah, it's bye for me as well. Bye. Offspring Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD and the Science Communication Working Group known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro, outro music is composed by Shana Tramkumar and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustav Carizzo. If you'd like to give any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please write to us at offspring.podcasts at psnet.npg.de. Until then, until, see, until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. See you. Bye-bye. <laughs>